All right, everyone. Thursday morning briefing. Celtic way. Hamish, Tony, Joe. Hello. <laughs> How are we all getting on, everyone? Are you? Are you all? Uh, are you all well? Um, the chat's flying today. Wow. Morning, Chris. Morning, William. Morning, four twenty somewhere. Morning, Jerry. Morning, Tam. Morning, Tony. Real- is your real football back yet? No, it's no back yet. <laughs> By that, you don't it? happen to mean uh, you don't happen to mean Steve Clark's flamboyant <laughs> swashbuckle in Scotland, do you? Because they're they're certainly back tomorrow. Cannot wait to watch that. Oh, <laughs> dear, oh dear. That's tonight for uh, you and I, Joe. Isn't yes, it? IGV yes. four yes. tomorrow right, for yeah. you, Hamish. Yeah. I think it's like a quarter to five kickoff. Not sure I'll be setting the alarm to watch uh, <laughs> Steve Clark's Scotland after the summer. Uh, what about you guys? Will you be watching it? I'll tune in. Yeah, um, I'll watch it and see if we've learned any lessons from the debacle that was the summer. Uh, we'll not really talk about that. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> you just get withdrawal symptoms, don't you, when the club football finishes and international break comes along? Oh something, yeah. You know? Weeping and a gnashing of teeth, and you try so hard to get up for internationals, but it's just not the same. You're just not as invested as you ever would be in your club football. That, I, I'm speaking for myself personally. I don't know about others, but you know, with the most respect to to Scotland, and you know, always hope they always hope they succeed. Yeah, obviously being Scottish, but this time in particular reminds me of remember when the Invincible season finished. And with that, obviously, fantastic finish at hand, and you know the sky opens up, lightning. Tom Rogic clutching a jersey, and then the next day was the one of the charity games. I think it was Hendrick's Heroes and Lubos Legends or something like that. You know, a string of charity games. But I believe yeah. that was part of the next day they brought yeah, the trophies yeah. out. And there was a real sense. I remember walking back from the game, going out of town that evening, and it felt like. That charity game felt like an extension of the season, and he's that real sense of you know sometimes you finish a campaign and you go oh, that was breathtaking, but you know I could go a wee break now, not too long, but you just need to step back. Whereas everybody just wanted it to continue. This international break since Sunday, I realise we're only on Thursday here in Scotland time, but um, it feels like that. It feels like I didn't quite <laughs> want the the club football to go away. Um, and I say that with the most respect to Steve Clark and his Scotland side, which includes Celtic players, of course. So. Which, um, just on that subject, which Scotland game took place a week after we clinched the Invincible treble at the same stadium? And it was a pretty memorable one, let's just say. Ooh. 17. No, I'm drawing a blank. Scotland 2, England 2, Lee Griffiths, Ah, three kicks into Joe Hart. My goodness, yeah. I don't have that in my head. I watched that in the house. Uh, I watched that. I watched the second <laughs> half and saw those goals with my dad. And I wouldn't have placed them anywhere near each other. I know. Joe I mean, Hart and goals for England. The, the yeah. only time I've lost my shape as a journalist in the press box and all thoughts <laughs> of impartiality went out the window because <laughs> some English journal had gave us it tight when Alex Oxley Chamberlain opened the scoring. Yes. And I kid you not, when <laughs> scored the scored the first one, I was I was uh, yeah uh, a bit of a frenzied state. But the second one, it was just all hell broke loose. Oh. Think Tasmanian, think Tasmanian devil meets Yosemite Sam. That was your old dad here. <laughs> and then when a Harry Kane equaliser got it back in equal measure, you dish it out, you've got to take it. But it was just a, it remains for me. Uh, Covering games as a, as a journalist, that that like five minutes is just like one of the most breathtaking yeah, yeah. and best I've ever experienced. Even even with Celtic, I, I I've always kept my shape watching Celtic and press boxes and stuff. And there's been, I mean, uh, but that was just incredible. I mean, obviously spurred on by your man giving it a, giving it to his tight when Oxley Chamberlain scored, but just completely and utterly lost it. I was like, it was brilliant, uh, yeah. and it felt good because I, for the first time in many years, I acted like a fan. It felt absolutely <laughs> magic. The only other time resembled that was when Roderick scored, but I wasn't in the press box that day. I was there with my nephew and my father, and my nephew said yeah. to me, "That's the first time I've ever seen you lose it completely." 
you know, because usually I'm quite reserved. <laughs> That's what you do for a living. But it's like when Rodgick scored and when Lee Griffith scored, those two are just absolutely tonto. But I think you're allowed to, aren't you? They're both special occasions, which yeah. you'll probably never see again. And they all, as I say, they all happened within, what, yeah, I think it was a week, week of each yeah. other. Yeah, a week. Uh, week so, yeah. It was it was totally mad. Um, that, um, I know this isn't a Scotland show, but that those Griffiths free kicks for me were like one of the most crazy moments I've ever seen watching football. When have you ever seen a guy score two free kicks in a row inside the last 10 minutes to go level with and then go ahead of your, your biggest rivals? I was trying to think of like a, a kind of, Celtic moment like that and the closest thing would maybe be the the 3-0 derby when we got the back-to-back goals or the 6-2 game when we were 3-0 up within 10-15 minutes um, but it was the fact it was two free kicks in a row and as we say it was uh, Lee Griffiths into Joe Hart as well bizarre yeah I think that this is this wasn't the same game but I remember at the time being reminded of Nakamura against Man United, having scored yeah. against Edwin yeah. van der Sar down there, and then having scored up here. Two weeks apart, sure, totally different games, and, and, and no way the same in that regard. But being able to beat a top-class keeper with a free kick twice in quick succession. But Griffiths was... I mean, I need to watch them back. Do we think that was, was, Hart, um, was Hart at all to blame for them? I don't remember. I remember being right doesn't matter. I used to blame them both. <laughs> I used to always Many, uh, people up. I used to wind people up and say, once was lucky, twice was showboating. <laughs> yeah. like, oh, imagine um, imagine you'd have gone back to 2017 and told you when those free kicks went in, right, Lee Griffiths, Joe Hart, one of them will be absolutely adored by the Celtic support. Yeah. And the other, we kind of, you know, we still appreciate what he did, but we don't hold him in the, the same regard. You would never have thought Joe Hart would have been the one you'd have been absolutely loving. It's just football, it's... Uh, it's mad the way it works out. Uh, listen, Scott has uh, reminded me of something. Uh, he said, you never came on Facebook for some reason. I'm not a man to, to apportion blame in any way, but a certain man uh, who may or may not be here uh, forgot <laughs> to like the Facebook today. So that's the reason we're not on the Facebook. I believe it will be sorted going forward. Uh, so apologies, Scott. Glad you found us on YouTube. Hopefully uh, that was all right for you getting across. Uh, Just want to flick this one up as well. As that was the first cup final I was at, covering Celtic, and David Province free kick lingers long in the memory for a lot of Celtic supporters, mainly because of Archie's commentary just prior to it, when he said only twice before in the history of the Scottish Cup final have goals been scored direct from a free kick. Is this a little bit of history? Just teed it up nicely, Province. Bends into the top corner. Archie, it is! <laughs> He's just lost it as well. <laughs> He's, he just, I mean, well-rehearsed ad-libs, as I call them. Because John Watson had it when Wimbledon beat Liverpool. As soon as the final whistle went, and he said, the crazy gang are beating the culture club. You know, there's no way you think of that off the top of your head. <laughs> He's like kind of sitting there praying that it happened so he can say this line. Uh, and Archie did the same. Just teed it up brilliantly. Problem puts the ball down and puts it in the net. It was just uh, a brilliant free kick. I love international week because you could down rabbit holes. It's great. And people and I love the comment that's coming in with their thoughts as well. It's brilliant, which because it just throws up a myriad of memories. It's magic. It is. It's a good time to do all that stuff, isn't it? The international break. Um, yeah, uh, we can probably talk about the Champions League squad if you want for a wee bit. I don't know how how long we can chat about that. The the point a lot of people are are bringing up, uh, Dennis, for example, um, talking about the main player who's been left out of our squad. It's funny because I was reading, going down the list, going, right, who's missing here? And I couldn't actually work out who, the like, if anyone was missing, which probably isn't a great look for this guy that I didn't even realise he wasn't there. Um, Owen Thiago Home is not in the Champions League squad. Uh, he's been left out. New signings: Austin Trusty, Alex Valle, Luke McCowan, Arne Engels, um, Adamida, Paulo Bernardo. They're all in. Um, Adam Montgomery's in there, guys. I guess he kind of ticks the homegrown box. Was there? What, what did you make when make of uh, that when you saw it, Joe? Yeah, um, I think it probably doesn't bode too well for Odin Tiago home. We've said this on this pod, we've said it on and off camera as well. There's maybe something about home that 
it just hasn't quite captured the imagination. I don't think that's that's unfair to say. I, I, I always say this whenever I'm being critical of a Celtic player who's maybe not broken into the team that you want to see players get time. Unfortunately, Celtic or teams like Celtic, you don't get an inordinate amount of time. He's yeah. maybe not had as much as other players, but he has had some. And in those moments, he's speaking personally, he's certainly not set the head of the light for me. Um, and I think that the Champions League squad, I mean, it would have been, it would have been a surprise if, if some of the, the players that the, the manager had, um, or the club had brought in last week weren't featuring, but it kind of underlines that intent. These are the guys that, that the manager wanted. These are the guys that the manager wants to take forward. And someone needs to drop out. I was similar to yourself. I looked at the the lineup, and at first I couldn't think who was who was missing. <laughs> then I realised it was home, and then your mind starts to think it probably makes sense. You know, if someone yeah, had yeah. to, if someone had to to drop out, um, I'm sure you guys will share your thoughts on home specifically. Uh, one thing I loved about the Champions League uh, review was these strips. See this big white on the back with the numbers and the letter, yeah, and I'm cool. a sucker for this font. Yeah, and someone pointed out that the hoops are still there. They're just whited out. Again, it's oh, I mean, I I, I, uh, I know I've kept something for everyone, but I love those wee subtleties. It gets me going. <laughs> Glad to I quite it. like that Thanks as well, Joe. Yeah, I, I quite like that because I always felt that you could. What, what was stopping Celtic from doing that, putting a white panel on, actually on the hoops, and yeah. then doing it like that? It just seemed, it, it, it always seemed right for it, but nobody, I mean, in the years gone past, they used to have black numbers on the hoops when I watched them in Europe, and oh, <laughs> try to decipher them and make them out of things was yeah. ridiculous, but, you know, it was a, but Thiago Home, you, you worry for him now, don't you? In terms of what yeah. happens now, where does he go? What what's what does the future hold? Is is that a declaration of that he'll probably you know if when he plays he'll, he'll well he's going to have to play domestically, isn't he? If he plays at all, because he he's not in the squad, so he just uh, and I think a lot of people think there's ability there, but we talked about it yesterday. We're well stocked for midfielders now, and it's hard to see where he fits in in, in those kind of games, isn't it? So. Uh, a major surprise for me, though, that he was left out. So you have was to it? say it was. I, 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 when when you consider he he took Yang, I'd be inclined maybe to have included home rather than Yang, but that's just a personal preference for me. But uh, so, but I would imagine certainly in the domestic games. Then I think the manager might use them domestic games and rotate a lot. So hopefully it's not a, a bleak future for him and hopefully if he does get the chance domestically he can show that he is he can make his mark and still find a way and uh, you know forge a decent future for himself at the club because I still think there's there's talent there. But yeah. I guess the manager feels that it's not enough to make him one of his midfielders for, for the step up in class and step up in level. So I guess that's all down to the player, isn't it? I say it all the time. The manager lays great stock in what he sees at training. So it's clearly, he's clearly decided home's not for him for the Champions League games anyway. Yeah, TJ Lindy uh, reckoning that he'll play more weekends when the Champions League starts. Um, says he's got experience playing in the McGregor roles. Well, it's interesting because in previous years, I could be imagining this, but I feel like in previous years there'd been a lot of chat about like, three or four players missing out, whereas this year it's, it's own home is really the only one we're, we're speaking about. Um, I guess that shows that the squad has been trimmed, uh, which is obviously good news. I was kind of looking at what, if it wasn't going to be home that he left out, who else he could have left out, and obviously you're talking non-Scottish players, um, and I mean, Narovsky's maybe someone you could look at, because we've got, I think, four defenders... Uh, other than him, you know, Welsh scales, trusty Carter Vickers. Um, but, you know, I think a couple of centre-back injuries away from potentially needing to play Narovsky. Uh, so I, I get think that. that was a belt and, I think that was a belt and braces job because remember what happened at Ivory the first game last season. Yeah. Uh, Lager Bielka and Scales played, so I think he just, to be sure, to be sure type thing and just thought, right, yeah. he'll I'll put him in just in case. Mm-hmm. You know, because it, when everything's going so well, you're waiting on the 
the butt claws, aren't you? You're waiting on the punch in the nose. You're waiting on the the bit of bad luck to come your way, you know, because you just think it's all going too well. Where's the bump in the road? Where's the roadblock? That kind of thing. So, mm. not wishing it upon Celtic, but you just kind of it's in the back of your mind, isn't it? Yeah, Yang was the other one I thought of, Tony. But um, I, I'm thinking probably the lack of wingers and the fact there's only four other wingers for two positions and wingers can quite easily get injured and you're maybe even viewing Maida as a striker maybe at some stage, possibly, hopefully not, but possibly that might have kept Yang in the squad as well. So yeah, I think home probably is the one I would have left out if I'm totally honest. Um, he's now got five players ahead of him, quite obviously guys. Uh, I must say I, I, I'm I, not convinced we're going to see him too often. Um I just think I don't think Brendan Rodgers is a, a big fan of him, or certainly not as big a fan as some of the other names we've got there. And as I say, there's like you're looking at five players now being ahead of him. So I'm I'm concerned about Odin Holmes' future at, at Celtic. Um I could be wrong, he might feature in league games, he might still go on to become a, a big player for us, but I've just I've never actually watched him I've seen him do good things here and there, but I've never watched home play for a match and gone, that was a performance that's convinced me. I think he kind of comes in and out of games, does the odd wee thing, probably doesn't do enough for me, although I must say, like I've probably seen him play half a dozen times if I'm honest, Joe. Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, yeah, just showing that showing that character on the pitch it kind of reminds me of um, when Ryan Christie broke into the team in 2018. Brendan Rodgers last season it was a European game before that uh, League Cup semi final. The opponent escapes me now, um, but Christie had come Leipzig. back from that season long. It might have been Leipzig, yeah. It would have been Leipzig, yeah. Um, and Christie had come back from that season long loan at, at Aberdeen and. 25 years old, you know, kind of pushing the age where, you know, thinking that he's, he's left it too long to make his mark at Celtic and he might have been heading for the door. And I remember him just energetic all over the pitch and it felt like what you were saying there, that this was a performance that was starting to pave the way for something. And who knew what the future held at that point, but it was, you could see the, the, the rumblings of something coming good. That Hearts game at Murrayfield in, in the League Cup semi-final. You know, he's, he's got a big hand in all three goals. He scores the only goal that wins the League Cup final in the rest of history for, for Chris State Celtic. Um, with home, you know, maybe doesn't need that level of, of introduction, but I've personally not seen anything yet where I've thought, yeah, this is the one. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's all circumstantial, I suppose. Possibly totally different position, obviously, but maybe you could be saying the same about Liam Scales this time last year. As you say, Tony comes into the squad um, as a bit of a, an anomaly. The player himself has said that he didn't expect to be anywhere near that position. He was looking at where his next loan move was and um, trying to work out his own future. You just can't see, and you would like to hope that in the same situation, you, you never want to see players get injured, but there are so many players ahead of home now that that would be a real catastrophe if the same situation were to present itself for home. And otherwise... Unless needed in that way, I can't see him getting into Brendan Rodgers' side because I think we would have seen him before now. Hmm. I mean, you can yeah. you can turn it around. Scales is living proof sure. of that. But as you say, you need an opportunity. Yeah, uh, you need an opportunity, and it, and it would take a an incredible set of circumstances that led to the fortune that Liam Scales got for that to happen. You don't want that to happen, and I guess that I mean the manager did tell him, didn't he, after the Queen's Park game? Him and Bolson in the while that they needed to do more. And one of them sang for Stoke City in the window. <laughs> the other one's still here. But, you know, it looking like that their game time could be limited. Because you don't even see domestically how he's going to oust some of those guys that are in front of him. You know, and I know, and even then, when the manager rotates, he's going to use others, isn't he? I'm thinking, mm. particular Luke McCowan. Yeah, personally, and from what I've been reading and what I've seen of Luke McCowan, I, I said it yesterday, I, I think Luke McCowan will be the surprise package of all the signings. And I, I got dug up yesterday because I called Arnie Engels, Engels. So I've been I've been told to, to get <laughs> Who it Who dug right. you up? Oh, the, the, Derek the, Ray? They missed, nothing. They, they, they missed nothing on this, but I, I consulted Ryan, who consulted Derek Ray, 
I'm told it's Engels. It's not Engels. And yeah, Engels. I was working on Engels. Yeah, I was working on the premise that in German, he's not German, he's Belgian. But I was just because he played in German football, had it in my head. Yeah, the yeah. G in German is pronounced as K. So that's where my pronunciation came from. But I'm reliably informed from Derek Ray, the doyen of these of German football, who and who knows everything and knows all the pronunciations that it's Engels. Not Engels, Engels. So sorry Engels. if I upset people and offended people <laughs> by calling them Engels on the broadcast. Didn't mean to. I was I was just uh, just being informed myself. So there you go. Hopefully that squares it all up, Hamish, and we can get on with life. And thank you for everybody for pointing that out. Appreciate it. <laughs> they missed nothing. <laughs> They're an astute bunch on this uh, Celtic Wave platform. Yes. Yes. Uh, think England. Engels. Is that kind of how it works? Uh, Engels, England. I know it's not Engels, the, but the kind of the G, the G the, part of it. The, the, the G's not pronounced, so it's Engels. Okay, not, it's not Engels. a hard, it's not a hard G. So fantastic. Yeah. Derek raised the man; he knows these things. So yes. uh, it's, I will, I will go with him. Joe, we've not even had your thoughts on Sunday yet, have we? So uh, let us know what you made of that. It's all right, wasn't it? It was all right. <laughs> Yeah, um, I may or may not have watched it back a few times since. It's funny with perspective, um, and apologies, I've not tuned into the morning briefing as much as I wanted this week. I've been a wee bit unwell. Um, but So if I'm repeating uh, things that you guys have said, you'll need to forgive me. Uh, but there was all that talk about Celtic being a little bit under pressure in the opening 10 minutes, and... Watching it live, I felt the same. And watching it back, as I say, I may or may not have watched the full game back since once or twice. Uh, it doesn't, you know, once you know how things are going to unfold, I don't even know if it was 10 minutes. And I don't even know that we we'll, we'll Celtic were under that much pressure either. No, it no. Just, um, it is that even. is with the, yeah, it's with the broader picture. It's, it's, it is how Rangers, I think, had to approach the game. I certainly think that, if they weren't attacking the game, they had to meet Celtic further up the pitch, just given the circumstances, given the 100% Celtic crowd, given how Celtic are playing just now. and uh, They did that for a little bit and then seemed to get spooked by the goal that was disallowed for reasons unknown, to be quite honest. <laughs> uh, and obviously it didn't, it didn't make too much of a difference. But yeah, it was, it was a, a comprehensive win and also... It was great to see some of the new faces as well. I know that you guys will have dissected this over the last few days, but I'm sure we're we're kind of singing from uh, the same hymn sheet in the sense of yeah, that was the only that was the only thing that that kind of surprised me when you look back in that opening spell where uh, at the time I thought we were a little bit under the cosh, but watching it back, knowing how it was going to unfold, it wasn't anywhere near as alarming as I felt. Yeah, it's quite surprising because uh, it's quite nice to have that. Yeah, I love. Yeah. I, I have to say, a, a lot's been made of this opening ten minutes. Mm-hmm. There's been straws being clutched at from various people from the other side of the city, and you're saying to yourself, and everybody tells you a game last ninety minutes, and yeah, they they force Celtic back. Brendan Rodgers mentioned it in his press conference. Well, the press wasn't as high or as good in the opening ten minutes spell, but. Casper Michael never had a safe to make. And yeah. uh, they, they had a couple of chances which have since been shown would have been flagged for offside. Yep. Well we we hope they would have. <laughs> you never know. The way the way it was going, they might not. but so I I'm I, I'm kinda of find that a bit unfathomable how ten minutes can morph into something that that, that there wasn't much between the two teams. You know, as I've said before, I, I don't deal in XG. I deal in AG, actual goals. Celtic scored three, Rangers scored none, and Celtic missed umpteen chances where it could have been four, five, six. That's undeniable. You can skew the stats narrative and you can skew the opening 10 minutes narrative all you like. Celtic bossed that game. Somebody presents me with a stat sheet and says, but that's actually not the case. I don't care. 
I know what I watched. I know what I saw. I saw Bernardo being a man of the match by a country mile. I saw McGregor not that far behind him. I saw Johnston being excellent. I saw Kyogo being excellent. I saw Maida being excellent. Uh, so if somebody's going to turn and say to me, but actually, the, their stats, I'm going to say, well, I'm no, don't pay too much attention to that kind of stuff because you can skew a, a stats narrative wherever you want. As I say, expected goals don't impress me much. Actual goals do. And the actual score, I think, you'll find was Celtic 3 Rangers now over 90 minutes. No 10, no 15, no 20, over 90. And that, to me, was a resounding, convincing win. And as Joe said, it was quite good. As good things go, it was quite good, wasn't it? Yeah. I think there's no doubt to me that Celtic were unsettled in the first 10 minutes. I think we, we saw a couple of players passing the ball out the park. Carter Vickers did it. Um, Hatati, I think, was the other one who just passed out the park. That doesn't normally happen. Rangers were pressing us, but it took one uh, moment of brilliance from Callum McGregor to run past Diamandi. He switched off for a second. Six Rangers players were out the picture, and suddenly Kuhn was running through. And I know that, but I, I think that could and should have been a goal. It wasn't, but that changed the game for me. It put doubt into their minds. It gave us all the confidence we, we needed. Um, so, yeah, and See other that, than that, we were... See if that's given us goal of the season for me. Yeah, it was because fabulous. Of the it it, and the, and it the, excites the, me uh, so uh, much. See the Champions know, League, uh, like see for yeah. the Champions League that quick and size of football that when because teams are going to leave gaps like that in the Champions League. The idea for me of Maida Kun Kyogo, oh god, like I, I'm so excited to see those guys in the Champions League. Yeah, so excited. I mean, building up to building up to the game, and I mentioned this when we're doing the. The transfer uh, window pod late on, on Friday at this end, like the word that the captain kept using building up was slick. And it's been a joy to see how slick the football has been. Every time he says it, it sends a shiver up my spine. And that was yeah. it on the opening stages uh, throughout the whole game. But um, after we kind of weathered that rough patch, and as you say, that moment where he steps by Diamandi. I mean, to play devil's advocate, hearing a lot of the statistical chat coming from Philip Clement after the game. I suppose that is what he has to work with at the moment. It's just that projecting it in such a public fashion in the wake of such a sensitive game in terms of a defeat, uh, yeah, it, it, it plays into it plays into a lot of Celtic fans' hands and then certainly upsets the fans that he's playing for. Um, that's surely stuff he needs to be presenting behind the scenes, in my opinion. But yeah, I, I think uh, everything just seems to be going the right way. And as you say, like teams are a lot less likely to sit in in the way that Rangers ultimately did. I mean, that was talk about possession stats. A lot of people have, have, have rightly kind of clipped this up and, and shared it on social media where Rangers were playing a lot of the ball about the box and Celtic had no need to, to press the game and waste energy at that time. And that's that that whole, um, you know, Brendan Rodgers calling for patience in his press and, the I actually thought again this is more watching the game back. Like I thought we talk a lot about counter press in the modern game. I thought Rangers counter press was actually all right. It's just that Celtic's counter of that was just phenomenal. I mean I know that a lot has been yeah, made yeah. about Dyson Maida in that moment that he wins the ball back for Calum Vegas goal. That was the epitome of it. But I actually thought that in my opinion at times Rangers were pressing Celtic. It's just that Celtic were just so strong and able to press that back even further, which is only I mean, I sound like I'm giving credit to Rangers. For me, it's not even about that. It's about how do you adapt to a team that's trying to do it to you. And Celtic were just so good at it uh, last Sunday. And yeah, that should bode well for the Champions League. I'm really excited about that now. But you even saw players like Kyogo doing it. I mean, there was that one where Kyogo sprinted about 50 yards. Yeah. And I think it was yeah. Liam Scales won yeah. the sliding More tackle. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and they've just bought into what the manager wants them to do. And, he, and he's spoken about it, he's spoken about the press and he's spoken about the guys being able to make on-field decisions without looking to their manager. The, you know, that, you know, sussing out the game and knowing what's happening and just, as you say, you, you, you trust them now to work it out for themselves what's happening and then stick to your own football and principles and it will work. What we're doing will work. You'll be successful, mm. but you have to bide your time and wait in the moments and when those moments come, you've got to pick them off and be slick. As you said, Joe, and that that goal, that disallowed goal, that was 
that was one such moment, wasn't it? Because it took one thing, and as Amy said, six guys were out of position or were taken out. And two passes later, you know, Kyogo scoring the ball, scoring the goal. And you're thinking to yourself, and that does excite you, Hamish, that the thought that they could do that. I spoke about yesterday the the goal in, against Bayer Leverkusen, wasn't it? When it was a long ball for the goalkeeper, a touch from James Forrest, wasn't it? Inside, back, then out to Jota, who buried it. And when you saw a goal like that, you were like, oh man, that's, that's just a brilliant counter-attacking goal. But you see that in this team now. You can see mm-hmm. this team doing that away from home and that excites you and you think to yourself, great, we're finally getting a bit of confidence about the fact that not only can you go away, but you're actually going to be a threat. You're going to score goals because of the way you're playing and the way you're set up to play. And every member of that team's bought into it and, and knows their job and knows what they're doing. So hopefully, as I say, it can transition domestically into the Champions League. Was it two weeks today? We got underway against Slovan Bratislava um, at Celtic Park. That's going to be magic. Bit of pressure on is that game, but win that, and you can really go into the the small matter of uh, Signal Iduna Park and Borussia Dortmund with uh, three points under your belt. Just on the the uh, topic of Champions League, a uh, few commenters talking about it. Um, Celtic women uh, won the game yesterday. You might remember we mentioned that they'd gone behind yesterday and. Against the uh, Finnish side, Coops, K-U-P-S. We came back to 1-3-1. A uh, hat-trick from Saoirse Noonan. Uh, went to extra time. She scored the first one, obviously, before that. And then two in extra time. So we're through uh, to Saturday's final, where we'll play uh, Gintra, a Lithuanian team. Uh, the tournament's actually been held in Lithuania. The wee mini tournament. They won 5-0 yesterday against Ameni Noi of Moldova, so it's an away game for us uh, on Saturday, but without knowing a great deal about Gintra, obviously they're not bad if they've won 5-0, but you would kind of think maybe uh, Celtic women would, would fancy that one, so that's on uh, on Saturday so we might have both of our teams in the Champions League this year which would be fantastic um, I was going to write up a couple of comments before we go uh, I'm going to do this very quickly uh, Chris, which Celts got an international call this time around? So I've got the squad in front of me, guys. Casper Schmeichel, Alistair Johnson, Liam Scales, Austin Trusty, Lewis Palmer, I've not seen, but I assume he's away with Honduras. Uh, Adamida, we had Sinizalos away with uh, Finland. Uh, Odin Tiago Holmes away with Norway's 21s, I believe. Arnie Engels is away with Belgium. Paulo Bernardo is away with Portugal's 21s. Dyson Maid and Real Hitati are away with Japan. Uh, and I think that's Anthony Ralston. And I think that's us. So hopefully that's cleared it up for you, Chris. Uh, and finally, Dave, guys, how far do you think we can go in the Champions League this year? I'm saying knockouts. I'm saying, I'm saying that we'll make the knockouts and then as we typically do fail when it gets to an actual knockout match. But I'd probably take that right now, so if you sign me up for that. I'd be happy with that. I think that I would love to think that it's this year is, I mean, you know, what it goes as far as possibly can. Um, Make the playoffs, make the knockouts, and I would be happy this season as well. I think it hopefully sets a precedent. And this, this encompasses everything in terms of future transfer windows, the manager's dedication or, or commitment to making inroads in Europe. I'm kind of hoping that we do as well as we can this year, but it also sets the tone moving forward. So, yeah, I'm hoping that it's positive enough to inspire not just this campaign, but the next one and the next one after that. And obviously, you need to win the league to do that as well. So I think it's massive. I think it's really, really big for Celtic to perform. And I hope that that's to the knockouts. I I share your sentiments, but I'm going to just put a tongue lid in it and say Slovan Bratislava. I'm not thinking any further than that. And getting it off to a flyer and just taking it from there. That that's the game that can really set your tone for the Champions League. And we've been here before and it's turned out to be a bit of a damp squib, but I just get a feeling that Celtic Cannon you said there 
Hamish, they're, they're under a lot of pressure. See, if you're a professional footballer, that's a, that's the a pressure you want. Yeah, as a supporter, yeah. it's that that's that pressure you crave at that top level of elite club football. Bring that on, and just you know, if you're talking about the Champions League, you just got to focus all your attention mm-hmm. into winning that first game. Because you win that first game, you're giving yourself a real good chance of doing something in, in that Champions League league phase. And I think that's what the manager will be drumming into the players as well. Got to get that first win under your belt. Get everybody, get the place rocking. Get people yeah, scared yeah. to come to Celtic Park again. And also get that confidence boost that we know we're taking on the Champions League runners up from last season and the Europa League winners back to back in the next two. But if you can get off to a flyer, then that confidence boost and surge you'll get and the players will, will feel that they belong at that level, then that can take you far as well. Yeah, we're going to go into overdrive if we uh, if we win that opening game. Celtic Park, I don't care if it's only Slovan Bratislava, Celtic Park is going to be absolutely jumping if we go ahead in that game. And personally, guys, I can't wait for it. Uh, right, my light has just died, so that's probably the cue for uh, me and <laughs> us to, to head off. Thanks once again for chatting about Celtic. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. The numbers are... Ho- oh, I've just looked and there's 666 people watching. Is that not the sign of the, the devil or something like that? I don't really, <laughs> don't really keep up with these things, but some, something <laughs> bad is going to happen to me now. Maybe I'm going to be subjected to 90 minutes of Steve Clark football. Maybe that's the, the bad <laughs> thing that's going to happen. Uh, anyway, enjoy that game, uh, Scotland v Poland later. Matthias Bogutz might feature for Poland in that one. Uh, not that it's of much interest to us. Uh, right, going to head off. We will return tomorrow to do it all again, everyone. Speak to you then. <laughs>